Grace and peace to you, United Church, and welcome for worship this Sunday. Um, this is the 23rd of April, and in our church in Van Lubeck Street, we have a guest preacher, Nathaniel Kohler, and uh, in our Kaimadi Chapel, we have Pearl Tubika. She's a probation, probationer who's going to be with us for the next year. We're going to be learning from her, and she's going to be learning from us as we train her for ministry and ordination. So I hope you're excited as I am about the year to come and all we can learn from one another. Now, we're not doing the same sermon that Nathaniel's doing this week. Um, we're letting him off doing the, the YouTube sermon. But what I'd like to do is a little bit of a recap and, and talk about a few other things that we missed out on last week in our subject matter. So why don't you join me in prayer as we come to talk about these things. Um, just before we do, though, it, we will be having the licensing service for Pearl, which is kind of a induction into this training period of her ministry and we'll be having it on the 30th of april at 2 p.m so if you can join us at united church in van Rubik street stellenbosch it'd be great to have you there to to celebrate this special season in pearl's life and in the life of of uh, amt power church in kalicha of our church here in stellenbosch united and of course the gg and zotriana church which i'm um, working with and helping to get through a difficult season in their life right now now, um, we, we just have so many exciting things happen, and I just encourage you to uh, follow the press, as it were, in our church and to see all the things that are going on. So let's pray. Father, thank you for this word. Thank you for the time together. We pray that you'd speak to us, speak through your word, and open our hearts to receive it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our first reading for this morning comes out of the New Testament out of the book of Matthew, and I'll be reading from chapter 8, verse 28, to chapter 9, verse 8. When he arrived at the other side in the region of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men coming from the tombs met him. They were so violent that no one could pass that way. What do you want with us, son of God? They shouted. Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? Some distance from them, a large herd of pigs was feeding. The demons begged Jesus, if you drive us out, send us into the herd of pigs. He said to them, go. So they came out and went into the pigs, and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and died in the water. Those tending the pigs ran off, went to the town, and reported all this, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. Then the whole town went out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they pleaded with him to leave their region. Jesus stepped into a boat, crossed over and came to his own town. Some men brought to him a paralytic lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. At this, some of the teachers of the law said to themselves, this fellow is blaspheming. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, Why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? Which is easier, to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, Get up, take your mat and go home. And the man got up and went home. When the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe, and they praised God, who had given such authority to men. Our second reading comes out of the Old Testament, out of the book of Genesis, and I'll be reading from chapter 1. Verse 1 to 5. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. 
Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was ho hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And here ends our readings. Amen. Let's pray. May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. In fact, we're revisiting the story of the um, casting out of the demons from the two men in the tombs, among the tombstones, where the demons were cast into the pigs, and then the story of the forgiveness of the sins of the man who needed healing and the questions that were asked of Jesus at that point. And we need to make a distinction at the beginning between the, the men with the demons and the illness. <clears throat> the men with the demons, there is this uh, malevolent force within them, this, these uh, demons within them that are making them behave in a certain way. There is a direct connection between um, what the New Testament listeners would have understood as the work of Satan and his demons and the malevolence of these spiritual forces and the effect on the human. So the, there is direct connection, evil and the behavior, the violence, the way the human is behaving. Now, we might think that it, it takes away the human responsibility from the, the matter. The demons are making them behave in a certain way, but actually, there, as we'll discover, there are certain things about this um, behavior, these, this condition of possession by demons, that still allow for culpability. We'll talk more about it then in a minute. But when Jesus forgives the sins of the man who needs healing, he he, he's not making connection between the illness or the disability and evil or sin, but what he is saying is that the real problem in humanity is not the disability, but rather the sin that is running through the human heart. So one of the facts of life is we face tragedy, and even if your life seems good right now, which in in my family, certainly, we're just in a good space. We, if we inventory where our life is at the moment, we're in a good space. But we face tragedy. And in my life, I've lost loved ones. Um, we've seen friends and family lose jobs. We've seen people become ill and have to be treated for things like cancer. And we've, we've seen tragedy, and all of us see it. There's just a fact of life. Disease and the brokenness of the world is, is there. What Jesus is saying is the thing that needs to be dealt with in us is not ultimately the disease. It will always be there with us as long as we're in this life. But what needs to be dealt with is the sin that is in the human heart, the sinful condition in the human heart. And so Jesus forgives the sins. Now, that's the distinction. That in the case of the demons, there is evil present and the evil is, in a sense, external. The disease is not the evil, the evil is the human heart, the disease is the result, the brokenness. Okay, so I hope that makes sense, but let's move on to really some things that we can, we can learn from this. Firstly, in these stories, the commentators tell us, in these stories about Jesus healing, Jesus casting out demons, um, and even some of the more disturbing stories like Jesus cursing the fig tree, it is an illustration of Jesus' lordship over creation and even over evil forces and over Satan. But in another place, Jesus' teaching on this matter of casting out of demons, he talks about a clean house. He says that the, the demonic activity is something like this. If the house is swept clean and, and the demons are, are um, expelled and the house is all clean, then that demon will go and invite seven others to come back and inhabit the house. There is, there is something about our lives that needs to be prepared. There's something that needs to be done in order to kind of bulletproof ourselves. The very simple answer to that, become a Christian, receive the Holy Spirit, 
Holy Spirit and evil spirit cannot live in the same person. So that really does bulletproof one against the possession, the, the, the indwelling of the spirit. Now, I have experienced and, and encountered evil in almost personified form before. And praying for people always results in a liberation, a setting free. Um, but this, this, there is a sense in which, in our age, we have to look at demons slightly differently to what the Bible saw, and particularly in our culture, to, what, to, to the stories we read in the Bible, because they are fairly vague in terms of detail. <clears throat> how the devil is working, how the evil forces are working among us. And there are so many things around us. One of the things that we find is the fact that we can, at the click of a mouse, we can see something that will excite us. At the click of the mouse, we can see a, a video that will um, intrigue us. And then we can see another one and another one. You know, if you go onto YouTube shorts, you can just watch one after the other after the other. And in all sorts of ways, we, we, we have the ability to click and see. And when we have a space in our lives which we allow to be filled, this clean house, which we allow to be filled with things that are not useful, we're opening ourselves up to influence. We're opening ourselves up to become um, involved in something which is not useful for us. And, and of course, you know, for young men, pornography, for women, the fantasies of um, romance and, and uh, even becoming caught up in the modern view of body image can be immensely destructive. But because of the internet and because of the, what surrounds us, we can become involved in these things really quickly. And we can, we can, in a sense, click through. We can end up in a space where we end up locked into these things. We become so intrigued with them that we need to see them. The experts are saying that the condition of somebody who clicks repeatedly on that button, the, the chemical reaction that happens, happens within us is very similar to the addiction to a substance. <clears throat> so basically what I'm trying to say is there's, if we have a house in order, but we become involved in something, we can easily get deeper into something which is destructive for us. And what we need to do in order to bullet to prove ourselves in terms of our relationship with God is work towards the Lord instead of allowing ourselves to be caught up and just sail down a stream of YouTube shorts to, to interrupt the process. Work towards the Lord. Um, watch something if you need to, something that is useful, a podcast that is teaching you, or watch some, you know, listen to some good Christian music. I don't think it's caught up in that cycle of allowing yourself to be caught up in something which is destructive for us. Now, these two men at the tomb had become caught in something which, in which not only was it destructive for them, but it was destructive for others. And we can easily become, um, we can easily become caught up in things which become destructive of the relationships around us. And that, that in, in the process of what, we, what the Alcoholics Anonymous course or program um, talks about that is the point at which something becomes a problem is when it begins to affect our real relationships and when we allow something like the internet or even things we read sometimes the news or intrigue in some sort of conspiracy theory to occupy our lives that we obsess over it and it begins to impact our human relationships that can be destructive I have a dear friend who during the um, COVID pandemic when I whatever you believe about the vaccines he, he was a fierce anti-vaxxer and it began to impact the relationships around him. So much so that, that even his relationship with his, his wife was, was seriously impaired by his view of, of the vaccine. Now, whatever you believe about it, whatever the news has taught us about it, when something we obsess over begins to impact our human relationships, that is when it becomes a problem, when we go deeper into it. These two men had been cast, they'd been just sent out, they'd gone out of community into the graveyard and they'd become deeper in it. There is, there is something potentially dangerous about becoming too involved in something which is fringe or on the edge and particularly something which, which is private. Um, very often people watching, the, the, looking at the internet, they end up doing it privately. But here's the thing. And um, these men then confront Jesus there, and the, the immediate response, their immediate response is, you're coming to change us. You're coming to deal with us before the appointed time. In other words, we thought we had lots of time to deal with this. And this is the, this is the approach of the addict. When we're in a place 
when we think we're okay because we've got time, we can still change it, I can, I can fix it anytime I want, this, but then we're in trouble because we, we're, we're so deep we do not even realize the damage that it's doing to us and to those around us. And research is showing that um, exposure to, to repeated hits of, of happy videos, I mean, maybe kitten videos or whatever you enjoy, but obviously things which affect us maybe sexually or in terms of our relationships, or, or we're just intrigued by because they make us perhaps morbidly curious about things that are going on. These, these things give us a, a, a dopamine hit. They give us a, a, a pleasure hit. And if we have this repeatedly every single day, it, begin to, it begins to, to, to draw us in and it becomes harder and harder to change it. And that when somebody begins to say to us, no, you need to change the way you do it, we become resistant like these men. No, I, I won't change it. It's almost as if we think that it's a good place to be. And it's, it's so scary, the idea that we might change, that we begin to believe somewhere which is clearly destructive for us is a good place to be. And you know, we, don't have to, um, we don't have to read far about the, the current research on, um, on uh, obsession with, with um, conspiracy theories, with, um, with things like YouTube shorts and short videos, but also with pornography and, and other aspects of the internet which draw people into this, this pleasure cycle. Um, we don't have to reach, research too far to understand that we need to stop it. We need to get out and change it. We have the choice. We have the ability to say, it's okay, I will change. We'll, we'll, we'll change the way we do it. And the destructive nature of it is shown in the story where the demons go into the pigs and they die. Now, we know from the scriptures that Satan does not have the power over life and death of humans. Um, but clearly the power is, is, is significant because when it's cast out of the people, it kills the pigs. And, and then finally, it, there, was a, there was a song by the Eagles back in the, I think it was the 80s, which um, was called Hotel California. And there's a line in the song, which was, which really, you know, it was focused on by churches as being something somewhat evil. But, but actually it's a great illustration of, of what these things do to us, where we get locked into something that we know is long, wrong for us, but we are so scared of stopping it. Somehow there's something within us visceral that will stop us from intervening or allowing someone to intervene in our lives. The line goes like this, you can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. And that's a lie. <laughs> well, it's, it, it is true of a lifestyle. Once you get into it, addiction, it is in a sense true, but it is a lie in terms of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, I, I, I love the, the, the writings and the testimonies of Jackie Pullinger. It scares me the kind of places that Jackie works. But the testimony of those who have been impacted by the power of God through his spirit to have their lives changed, even from addiction to heroin, which is possibly one of the most dangerous substances um, in terms of addiction and, and destroying lives, even having them changed, that God's intervention changes our life. It's a miracle. It just is a miracle. It's difficult to understand, but it is true, and I've seen it in life, not through what I've said or done, but simply through God working through community and through family to, to change people. Now, what happens in our lives, if we, if we don't allow God to intervene in our lives, we become like the Israelite people who wanted to go back to slavery. When God took the Israelites out of Egypt and they were in the desert, they were set free from slavery. They were set free from the barbaric world of the Egyptian slavery. But they wanted to go back because they were hungry, thirsty, they didn't trust that God was leading them. And when we, when we fail to trust God to take us out of something that is self-destructive into something that is good, we fail to trust him. We choose slavery to something. In a sense, we choose possession by something which is not God. It is demonic. And God calls us to trust him, to lead us out of the place of slavery into a place of freedom. It's a scary place. The, the, the desert is not a, an easy, happy-go-lucky place. It is filled with danger, tragedy, um, doubt, and, and difficulty, thirst, and hunger. But, but it is not slavery because there is a future, there is a hope, there is a journey. And God invites you out of a space of being locked into something, which you may even be terrified to leave, 
into a spiritual journey which will take you to his peace. For that is the promise of the promised land. And so I want to invite you to do this. Find a friend, a trustworthy friend. If there's something in your life which you locked into, you just find yourself doing far too much of, speak to them. Allow them to hold you accountable so that you will begin to change your behavior. Because there is no way we do this alone. We do this with a friend, we do this with a trusted confidant, but we also do it with God in the power of the Holy Spirit. So I want us to pray a prayer and give you some words to pray. As we pray this prayer, allow the Lord to work in your heart, perhaps to lead you to somebody trustworthy who could hold you accountable and help you to get out of the cycle which is click, 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 and deeper and deeper and deeper into a self-destructive and a relationship-destructive behavior. Something effectively demonic in our age. Um, so let's pray the prayer. Father, thank you that you have given us a hope and a future. Thank you that you have promised us that you will lead us out of slavery into a journey with you, which will bring us to the land of peace. And so we pray that you would open our hearts now to your way, Help us to, to set in our minds the goal of setting aside those things which, which are, are holding us fast, which are binding us into some sort of compulsion or addiction, into a path and a journey with you through a desert into the promised land which you have set ahead for us, this hope that things will be right. And so we commit our lives to you for that. Help us also, Father, to find somebody trustworthy to share this journey with. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.